Welcome to lecture eight in the series on banking and finance, really a course for undergraduates uh, just starting their degree in this particular area. So far we've looked at uh, a number of points usually related to the commercial side of banking, the private sector of banking and finance. And this lecture is about the framework within which that all works. And of course, the framework is uh, imposed upon this sector by government, or more specifically, uh, by the government central bank, the Bank of England. Now, over the years, I have uh, been to many um, debates, discussions, uh, with academics and with professionals in banking and finance. And whenever uh, someone from the Bank of England walks in the room, there's a sort of hushed reverence. And it's always concerned me that there is very little argument when the Bank of England talk, uh, very little discussion. People just accept what they say without looking very carefully into what it is they are saying. And as an academic, I've always found that a little bit frustrating. I suppose I've realised over the years the reason for this is that quite a lot of people sitting in the room uh, worry that at some point in the future they may have to go cap in hand to the Bank of England and they don't want to be remembered as someone who had criticised the Bank of England in the past. Not that that would make any difference to the Bank of England's decisions, I'm sure. But... Uh, it, as an example, going back uh, many, many years, back in the 1970s, I was arguing with one of the members of the Monetary Policy Committee uh, about the fact that the Bank of England is the sole cause of inflation in the UK. And uh, uh, he explained, no, that wasn't the case. There were many causes uh, of inflation. And I said, no, there is only one cause of inflation. Uh, that's you. And this reference to cost push inflation which uh, arises out of Keynesian economics, is actually a fallacy. You cannot have cost push inflation. I'll explain exactly why a little bit further down uh, in this lecture once we've got started. Uh, but uh, uh, the Bank of England uh, denied uh, the fact that they were the cause of inflation. More recently, over the last uh, 10 years or so, I've argued with uh, or two members of the Monetary Policy Committee in front of an audience uh, of students. And I uh, have uh, raised the same point. I've said that uh, you are the sole cause of inflation, uh, uh, but you always imply that uh, something else has caused the inflation. I, I always said you have been deceitful in the sense that your inflation reports always explain what the current rate of inflation is uh, and then uh, you tell us of those prices which have gone up the most this month and uh, imply that they have caused the inflation and both of them actually said no no we don't do that uh, we uh, accept that we are the cause of inflation what we do do is give you the current rates uh, and then we tell you which prices have gone up the most and we let you make up your own mind and the press goes straight away and blames whatever we've said uh, as the prices have gone up the most as if they were the cause of inflation. So we're getting a little bit better, a little bit closer towards the Bank of England accepting uh, that the implication of such a thing as cost push inflation is wrong, but it takes, uh, it takes quite a lot of time and argument to get these things out in the open. The lecture was originally entitled uh, The Bank of England, Villain uh, or Saviour. And I really would like to look through uh, a number of issues where I think the Bank of England has been at fault, but I'm quite happy to recognise uh, the things that the Bank of England has done well. So you can make up your mind, own oh mind at the end, whether or not you think that the Bank of England is that villain uh, or that saviour of the economy and the monetary system. Now you can divide the main roles of the Bank of England up into two groups. There's the, the regulatory policy side of things and there's the monetary policy side of things. 
Regulatory policy is uh, managed by the Financial Policy Committee and that's uh, subdivided into to two parts. The Prudential Regulation Authority which is inside the bank uh, and then an organisation which is actually managed by the bank but separate from the bank which is the Financial Conduct Authority. And then there's the monetary policy, which is managed uh, by the Monetary Policy Committee, often referred to as the, the MPC. Now these uh, roles uh, are uh, separate. Uh, the regulatory side of things deals with parts of banking and finance and individual institutions within banking and finance and general rules for institutions within the sector. Whereas monetary policy is very much uh, a national management policy of the whole economy. That's how uh, they are different. And I'll talk a little bit about regulatory policy, but I'm not too critical of the role that the Bank of England has played in regulatory policy over the year. Uh, what's interesting to me uh, is the role that they've played in managing monetary policy, where I think they have made a number of mistakes. And so I will sort of talk us through those in the main part of this lecture and then go back to a uh, consideration of their overall role towards the end. If I talk briefly about regulatory policy, prior to uh, 2009, uh, there was a tripartite system which managed uh, banking and finance, and that was the Bank of England, Her Majesty's uh, Treasury, and the Financial Services Authority, the FSA. The tripartite system didn't really work uh, during the global financial crisis, and afterwards there was each component of this tripartite blaming the other component, uh, and uh, each component not quite sure what it should have been doing or what the other component should have been doing and therefore you end up with uh, not enough done or things done too late. So after the 2009 Banking Act the tripartite system was scrapped and it was all restructured under the umbrella of the Bank of England. So the Bank of England is now in, con in charge of regulatory policy uh, as well as monetary policy. And the three main concerns uh, of uh, regulatory policy are to protect the customer and the Financial Conduct Authority is uh, concerned with that. And then it's the business side of things which is looked after by the Prudential Regulation Authority where the business side is concerned with individual business of maintaining the soundness of one business and all businesses in the sector, but also avoiding systemic risk. Systemic risk is that risk that something that happens in one part will spill over into other parts of the sector. The obvious thing about that is, is money. If you look at uh, money, you'll remember that 5% uh, uh, of money is the currency or the cash that was created by the Bank of England, 95% of it has historically been created by the commercial or private sector uh, banking, uh, particularly retail banking. And if something happened, go back to Northern Rock, whereby people lose confidence that they might not be able to take their deposit out in the form of cash, then that can knock on from one institution to another. Now, bear in mind, there's only 5% of money is available in cash. That can very quickly lead to a systemic problem that you begin to worry, is my bank having the same difficulties of that bank? I better get my deposit out before uh, it collapses. So an important role for regulatory policy, particularly from the point of view of the Prudential Regulation Authority, is to try and make sure that we never have uh, the systemic risk uh, affecting banks within uh, the uh, banking and finance sector. So regulatory policy is concerned with dealing in that sector and I'm reasonably happy 
with what they've done. So I'm not going to say any more about that for the moment. I'm going to concentrate on the one which really becomes interesting to me, and that is monetary policy. Now, monetary policy is just managing the overall level of aggregate monetary demand in the economy by making two adjustments. One is to the rate of interest or the price of money, and the other is to the physical quantity of money in the economy. So monetary policy, managing the aggregate level of monetary demand by adjusting two levers, the rate of interest and the quantity of money. Now monetary policy is uh, one of the two main demand management policies in the economy. There used to be a third uh, uh, policy, which was exchange rate policy, which when we were under a fixed exchange rate system uh, could uh, be influential. But since we've been floating since 1971, uh, then there's very little that uh, central banks can do to influence and manipulate the exchange rate. Uh, so we're really looking with demand management policies as being two things, that's monetary policy and fiscal policy. Fiscal policy by definition is exactly the same as monetary policy except it has different levers. So fiscal policy is managing the overall level of aggregate monetary demand but it's using three levers now. It's using taxation uh, and it's uh, using borrowing uh, and the, the borrowing that uh, it does is of two sorts. It can actually borrow from real people which is a non-inflationary form of borrowing or it can effectively borrow from the Bank of England which is uh, leads to a money printing exercise as I'll explain uh, in just well I'll, I'll explain now shall I um, but before I do that let me go through a sort of cautionary tale about uh, uh, that aspect of central bank policy which allows them to print money for my undergraduates, I mean, we are located in the city of London, a few hundred yards away from uh, the Bank of England. And I asked them this question. I say, suppose you were going past the bank at the end of the day and there's a lot of things been thrown out and waiting for the refuse officers to come and pick up. And uh, there's a nice little machine there that uh, looks interesting and lots of paper and students always want paper. And so you pick up the machine, you pick up the paper. It's only being thrown away take it home and obviously uh, when you plug it in it doesn't work the Bank of England wouldn't be throwing it away if it uh, if it did work but you open the plug and you find it's just a fuse that's gone and you replace the fuse plug it back in the wall and uh, all the bells and whistles start up all the lights start flashing uh, and uh, you run a little bit of paper through it and out comes official 20 pound notes and I asked them what they would do. Now, obviously, a lot of people uh, say exactly what they would do with that. I'll pay off my student grant. Uh, I will uh, uh, give up my degree and become a, uh, an investment uh, um, banker. Uh, others, uh, I'll print out uh, a little bit of money for my local football team who keep losing and uh, they can buy themselves uh, uh, a better striker. Oh, and we go through these stories bit of entertainment. But my interest is with the people who won't print money. They'll take it back, uh, they want nothing to do with it. And I sort of talk to them gently to try and persuade them that they could print money, uh, they could print money and have no effect whatsoever on the economy. For example, I'd say, you know, suppose playing around with this, you've forgotten the fact you're going to go to the bank and uh, you need £100 for tomorrow. Why don't you print off five £20 notes today? You can spend them as you were going to spend them tomorrow. And if you don't want to have any impact at all on the economy, you can go to your own bank, you can take out five £20 notes tomorrow and you can burn them. Uh, and then there's been no impact of what you've done. Would you do that? Um, and some might and, and still some might not. So. I then start to talk about the charitable things that they could do if uh, they could print money, they could help charities that uh, are in trouble and they could do good things for society. 
and there still may be some people who don't want to uh, take this risk of, of printing this money so I eventually end up with uh, a story about uh, their granny who lives down the road in an old people's home and she's uh, almost blind uh, she knows her way around this home she knows the people all the family can visit her because it is only just down the road and you've heard this terrible thing that uh, the home is going to have to close down and they're moving uh, to some other part of uh, the UK which is hundreds of miles away. The reason why is that uh, they have a shortfall every week of around uh, £20,000 and uh, you could print that £20,000 and you could save the home from moving and keep granny nearby where you can visit her and look after her. So eventually I persuade everybody that given a printing press they'll print money. And that's if you like a little bit of a cautionary tale because anyone who gets a printing press can be persuaded to print money and to print money without any real idea of the impact that it's going to cause. So as far as the Bank of England is concerned there's plenty of economists out there, Keynesian economists, telling them why there's no problem if they print money to do uh, important things like infrastructure spending and support uh, unemployment and boost the economy and uh, uh, create jobs. Uh, there's modern monetary theory which is uh, uh, an offshoot if you like of this expansionary monetary policy type thinking. Uh, whereby uh, you can uh, uh, print away as long as you don't come up against the, the barrier of, uh, of high inflation. And of course printing money you won't come up against the barrier of high inflation until it's too late because of the time lags involved between you printing money and the impact that it has upon prices which means that uh, you tend to print too much. So. The students are now a little bit more aware of uh, what could possibly happen under a situation where someone has got hold of a printing press and we need to look at what the Bank of England does and think about the reasons why it does it and who's persuaded them that uh, this was a good idea or this was a good idea. Now before uh, we move on there's one other thing that I just want to sort out in your mind a confusion that often exists and that's the confusion between what's called monetarism which is uh, an economic philosophy if you like of, of how monetary policy should be used and how it's separate from monetary policy. So monetarism prescribes just one type of monetary policy. It prescribes a monetary policy where monetary demand grows at a steady rate to maintain price stability. Now there are lots of different monetary policies. Uh, the Keynesians have their own monetary policy. Uh, there are lots of different monetary policies that historically have been used uh, or could be used and only one of them is monetarism. Quite often you'll hear, hear a criticism of monetary policy which is that proves monetarism doesn't work as if they are the same thing, they're not. So I will develop that point a little bit uh, further. If you go to my blog uh, you can read about uh, that in as much as there is an article called Understanding Monetary Policy and a separate article Understanding Monetarism which uh, uh, should uh, separate those two things for you. Keynesians, they're quite happy to have a monetary policy but for them the monetary policy accommodates fiscal policy. Fiscal policy is the important thing as far as Keynesians are concerned. In fact they sort of dropped the idea of aggregate monetary demand to remind you it's nothing to do with money, it's aggregate demand that we want to manage and we want to manage that through government expenditure, through government borrowing, through budget deficits, through budget surpluses. Um, and all we need of monetary policy is it accommodates what we're doing. We know how to close output gaps, to boost economic growth, to boost employment. Monetary policy is unimportant except it accommodates uh, what uh, we want to do. 
Whereas if you're the monetarist, it's not that. Monetarist is monetary policy uh, is very important. Uh, some monetarists, even like myself, would say so important that I wouldn't even bother with fiscal policy. I wouldn't have a fiscal policy. I just have budgets which had to be balanced every, uh, uh, every year. But that's another story. Um, so monetarists just want their monetary policy to manage inflation and to maintain stable prices and maintain liquidity and maintain monetary stability. And it's just really one simple policy that you would want governments uh, to pursue. Now, what we then want as monetarists uh, would be for the Bank of England to man uh, manage monetary demand efficiently. Now, let me remind you, we have talked about this once before, but we're going to talk just about the money supply. And remember, the money supply is just two concentric circles. It's a little bit in the middle, which is cash or currency or legal tender. And uh, a bit round the outside, which is money that has been created by bank lending over the years, possibly over the centuries. And the total amount of money in the economy is represented by that outside circle. And uh, it's uh, the, the credit side of it described there is uh, about 95% of money is, is bank loan credit created money. And a little bit 5% or so in the middle is cash. Hasn't always been that uh, requirement, but uh, at the moment it's about that ratio. So that is the money stock, the stock of money in the economy. The other aspect of converting money supply into monetary demand is just to think like that. The two concentric circles are still there and they are a stock of money, but it's the speed at which you pass it from person to person, the velocity of circulation of that money that comes together stock and velocity which create monetary demand. Now the Bank of England, it has total control, 100%, well I suppose not 100% if you take counterfeiting into account, but let us take it as 100% control over cash because it prints and mints the stuff. So that bit in the middle is 100% controlled by the Bank of England. The outside circle is managed by the Bank of England, but it's the Bank of England trying to influence the amount of borrowing that uh, private banks do. If it puts interest rates up, it's trying to discourage borrowing and to stop that outer circle expanding. Uh, and if it uh, wants to expand the economy, supporting Keynesian fiscal policies, then it will lower interest rates to try and encourage borrowing to sort of push that outside circle. And in times of desperation, you've also heard the Bank of England almost trying to get people to spend money. Uh, and that's this velocity of circulation. It hasn't really got any control whatsoever over that. But there have been times where they've come out and said, come on, get out there and spend money. We want you to spend money. We need you to get back into uh, a spending routine uh, and, and not a savings routine. We want you spending money. So by saying that, they're trying to influence the velocity of circulation of, of money, but they have very little influence at all in that sector. So think of what the Bank of England can do to manipulate monetary demand. It can manage that inner bit cash and it can influence the outer circle by interest rate policy, price of money policy, uh, but it can't really interest, uh, sorry, influence the uh, flow of a circular flow of money, uh, the velocity of speed that it goes around that people present their money from one person to another. So the Bank of England has got influence, but it hasn't got total control over this system that it does like to control. Now, if you go back to the 1980s, uh, there was a discussion about whether the Bank of England should control interest rates or the quantity of money. Uh, if we're going to manage monetary demand, we could do it through interest rate policy or the quantity of money policy or both. 
Uh, I was part of uh, that debate and discouraged uh, the use of interest rates to manage uh, aggregate monetary demand. I pointed out some weaknesses that meant that it probably wouldn't work and some strengths in managing the quantity of money. Uh, but uh, as is usually the case, no one uh, listened to me and the decision was made more or less to deal with interest rates as the main policy for managing uh, monetary demand. So forgetting for a little bit the quantity of money in the economy uh, as a direct control, think about interest rates. So interest rates have gone up and down to encourage and discourage lending. Probably difficult for you even to uh, think that this was ever the case, uh, even though you may have lived through it. But uh, bank rate did reach 14.875% on October the 6th, 1989. So nearly 15%, which means that your mortgages would have been 17-18% uh, uh, at that time. So rates have been as high, uh, bank rate, sorry, has been as high as 15%. The financial crisis of 2007 saw rates starting um, at the beginning of the crisis, bank rate was 5.75% uh, and gradually it went down very quickly from 2007 to March 2009 uh, to 0.5% or half a percent. So from 5.75% down to half a percent. And uh, on August the, uh, uh, sorry, August 2016, the rate was lowered again to 0.25. And then we go to 2020, the pandemic, uh, then rates were reduced further to 0.1% with the expectation that 0% could be achieved and that we would even go negative on interest rates. Now I'm very much against negative interest rates. There'll be a disaster, but if you want to read about that, you can actually find that uh, article on, uh, on my blog. But you can see that there's been significant ups and downs in interest rates uh, over the years, trying to pursue a policy of encouraging or discouraging uh, borrowing. Now, There is a problem, often if you read textbooks about this, because they talk about the government's uh, bank rate uh, as the floor for interest rates. And if bank rate goes up, all interest rates are pushed up. If bank rate goes down, all interest rates uh, uh, go down. That's not actually correct. So the transmission mechanism doesn't work in that way. You do have a structure of interest rates in the economy now. If you want to go out and save money, you'll find that there are different rates in different places, a small range, not, not a particularly big range. But if you go out and want to borrow money, you'll find you can borrow money at probably uh, just under 2% for certain mortgages. Uh, you'll find that if you want payday loans, it'll probably be 2,000%. Uh, so you can see a whole range of interest rates, so the whole structure to interest rates, there's not just one out there. And the structure of interest rates tends to be determined by the acronym RAT, R-A-T, risk, amount and term. Interest rates will be higher if the risk is greater, if you're lending money to someone, uh, the amount that you're lending and the period of time over which you're lending are all important decisions when you're setting interest rates. So you have, uh, with the structure of interest rate, a secured end. That's where bank rate uh, uh, sits. And then you have the unsecured end where interest rates are a lot higher. And if we looked just at two examples of, of uh, both ends, just to, to get this clear, the bank rate is actually just the repo rate. And what's the repo rate? It's uh, the sale and repurchase rate for government securities where a bank aims to get a cash loan. So if you've got some government securities and you want a cash loan from the Bank of England, you can hand over the legal title to those securities. Uh, you keep the economic title, but you hand over the legal title to the Bank of England uh, and the Bank of England will lend you cash uh, and you will promise to buy back the government security at a point in the future. So you will repurchase the government security and take a, a temporary cash loan 
that's what bank rate is, so at the moment you can do that at 0.1%. If we took another thing that you're familiar with, which moves us towards the unsecured end of lending, uh, then we would go to credit cards. And before the global financial crisis, so early 2000, you would have seen a range of um, the lowest rates with bank rate at 5.75%. And you would probably find uh, you, you, credit card rates between 25 and 28% borrowing. Now, at this moment in time, you've got a range which is bank rate down at 0.1%. And you've got credit card borrowing at about to over 30%, 33% One of my students uh, uh, did that research a couple of years ago and looked at uh, credit card rates over the last uh, uh, 20 or 30 years and uh, found now that credit card rates are much higher uh, than they were when bank rate was 5.75. So bank rate is not bringing all interest rates up and down in the same way what it is doing is distorting the bottom end or the secured end. So it will bring mortgages down because that's a fairly secured form of lending, but it won't um, have much effect at the other end as you move closer and closer to unsecured lending. And it's, in, it's almost an interest rate illusion uh, that is going to cause problems for people with credit cards and private debt because people here that it's easy to borrow now, bank rate is so low uh, that it's, it's a good time to be borrowing money and most people don't realise what the interest rate is on their credit card because they're presented with a form that they don't actually recognise quite clearly what the interest rate is and so people on credit cards are borrowing more and more and more because interest rates are low but they're not, they're actually higher than they were before the global financial crisis so it is a sort of illusion that people have the idea that interest rates are low because bank rate is low but in actual fact uh, that isn't the case. So bear in mind that what the Bank of England is doing is not transmitting signals to all interest rates it's just bringing down a number of interest rates at the secured end what I as I have described it uh, as something that distorts interest rates rather than uh, moves them all in the same direction at the same time. So the bank uses those interest rates to try and manipulate the sort of outer concentric circle in that uh, two concentric circles that I showed you right at the start. For the quantity of money, the Bank of England has always made adjustments to the quantity of money as it manages liquidity in the banking system. There are certain times of the year when more cash is required uh, and more cash can be uh, released by the Bank of England through what's called open market operations and then it can be drawn back at other points in the year when it's not required. Christmas uh, used to be a time when people wanted uh, lots of cash. Uh, the end of the uh, tax year for um, uh, the self-employed uh, was a period of time when there would be quite a lot of cash required and the bank through open market operations could manage that liquidity. Now understanding open market operations helps you understand almost everything to do with the quantity of money because all the bank would do is the bank would buy some government securities that are already in circulation and it will pay for it by printed money. That increases the amount of cash in the system. If it wants to reduce the amount of cash in the system it just reverses that process. It takes the government securities it's previously bought, it sells them back into the real economy and removes the cash. So that was a fairly simple way of managing the quantity of money in the economy to maintain the liquidity requirements of business and maintain stability. Now after the crisis uh, you had a situation where there was great concern that there might be systemic risk and deflation that would occur uh, in 
uh, the, in the Western world, so in the UK economy, as far as the Bank of England is concerned. So very quickly, it lowered interest rates, as I described, from 5.75 all the way down to 0.5 over a fairly short space of time in an attempt to try and encourage banks to lend more money. However, there'd already been a fright with Northern Rock uh, and banks were concerned about how much cash they hold as a proportion of their total assets. So as more cash was put into the economy, so it wasn't used as a foundation for lending, it was restructuring the balance sheets of banks to increase the amount of cash that uh, they were holding, supporting all of their assets. So it didn't really work. We then go back into quantity of money, that's the other control that they've got, and we went into what was called an asset purchasing program, known as quantitative easing, where the Bank of England uh, does exactly what it did with expansionary OMO situations. It buys government debt and puts cash into the economy, expanding the money supply. Now, you know, remember, two concentric circles. If you put more cash in the middle, the outside expands as well. So you can stop this contraction taking place through an asset purchasing program. They actually put over a fairly short space of time, 435 billion pounds uh, of cash currency into the economy by buying back government debt through the quantitative easing program. Now, the Bank of England never will actually admit that this is printing money. And if you go to the Bank of England, you can get a little pink uh, pamphlet that tells you all about quantitative easing. And nowhere in that pamphlet does it tell you that it's printing money. They like to talk about electronic transfers and, uh, and ways that discourage you from thinking of this as a money printing process. But it is a money printing process in as much as every unit of electronic electronic money that's created is backed 100% by cash, that is the Bank of England will have to give you cash for that uh, if uh, you need or request cash. Now with the pandemic now that process of quantity of money expansion has carried on, so quantitative easing currently stands at £895 billion, pounds, uh, which is uh, considerably higher than the uh, original amount of £435 billion. Pounds. So this quantity of money policy is continuing on. And it's continuing on again because, you know, like I said, I could persuade anyone to print money if I could give them good enough reasons. There are good enough reasons created by economists, often Keynesian, modern monetary theorists, the expansionary interventionist economists that say now is the time you've got to create more spending power in the economy because now is the time with the pandemic uh, that we are concerned about monetary contractions, rising unemployment, falling economic growth. Now is the time for you to put more money into the economy and that's exactly what the Bank of England has done. Now did it choose the right amount to put into the economy? Uh, who knows? Uh, and something that is often overlooked about quantitative easing is that once you put this money into the economy, you will be buying government debt, some of it which will mature very quickly. Now, when that matures, the amount of uh, quantitative easing will start to contract and the Bank of England will need to buy more government uh, securities with printed money to maintain the same level. So. It is the case that as government debt held at the Bank of England matures, so if they want to maintain quantitative easing, they continue to buy into the um, financial markets and put more and more cash into the system to cover that uh, maturing debt. Now, as with OMOs, there was an expansionary side and a contractionary side. Uh, we can think of uh, quantitative easing as having the other side, quantitative tightening. Now, quantitative tightening would just be reversing this process. It would be taking the government debt that's been bought and held at the Bank of England and returning it, selling it into the economy and taking the cash out. That will be 
all quantitative tightening is. It's not a good idea to do, I'll explain why in just a moment, and the, the Fed in America illustrated that because it started a quantitative tightening uh, process uh, and very quickly it ran into problems and was asked to reverse uh, um, that particular uh, policy. Because once you've quantitatively eased, you've injected spending power into the economy. That spending power will have affected prices and the prices that it will have affected uh, will have risen. Now, if you want to reverse that process, then prices have got to come down again. That's dangerous. That's what you don't want. You don't want deflationary pressures in the economy. Uh, once you've put this money into the economy and it's circulating and it's used to measure prices, then you don't want that to be broken uh, because uh, you've got to reverse the change in the average level of prices and that can have damaging effects on the economy. So quantitative tightening I would not advise, but the Fed tried it and indeed the Bank of England um, not that long ago uh, said that we will very soon uh, reverse the process of quantitative easing, that is attempt quantitative tightening. They haven't done it yet and they're unlikely ever to do that uh, because uh, it does have a damaging effect. Once you put the money in to the economy and it's used in measuring people's incomes, their prices, everything else, then uh, why would you take any of it away? If you do, you'll have uh, a negative effect on the economy. So my advice always is once you've QE'd, then don't QT. Again, you can go to my blog there is an article there called understanding and misunderstanding QE uh, for those of you who want to read a little bit more about uh, what quantitative easing actually is. Now at this point I do also want to remind you because I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about uh, the impact of events uh, in the economy by adjusting the quantity of money and uh, I need to remind you of the quantity theory of money. And the quantity theory of money, it's Irving Fisher's uh, equation, which underpins monetarism. And in its simplest form, there are lots of complicated forms, but uh, in its simplest form, it's MV equals PT. Where M is the stock of money, M is the stock of money, it's that stock of money there. That's what M is. And V, it's those arrows there, V, the velocity of circulation of money. And that money stock times the velocity of circulation over a period of time gives you your monetary demand. On the other side, you've got a sort of real side to the economy. You've got the prices and the transactions. P is the average level of prices. T is the number of transactions in the economy and together they make up the national income or the GDP or whatever measure you would like of your real economy. So nice and simple, that's all it is, MV equals PT. And you can start playing around with it because it helps the, the brain work out some of the things that are going on in the economy. You can increase the M, the money stock, reduce V and have no effect on P and T. You can increase M and V and you will therefore have to have an effect on P and T together, or either P or T. If, for some reason or other, nothing changes except the velocity of circulation of money, if the velocity of circulation of money on its own goes up, it will affect P or T or both of them. So that's the foundation, if you like, of trying to understand monetarism and understand what's going on in the economy. And it should be, if you keep this in your mind, fairly easy for you to understand what I say next. And what we want as uh, monetarists, what the monetarists say about the economy, is the bank should maintain a steady and stable growth in monetary demand, where this measure is the broad money measure. It's the measure which accounts for all money, the cash and the bank lending that has created money. Uh, in the economy. And I would prefer, although not all monetarists would agree, I prefer using quantity of money lever 
on its own, not uh, the price of money lever as well. But there are some monetarists who are quite happy to argue uh, interest rate uh, controls rather than quantity controls. We're quite happy with open market operations to maintain the liquidity that's required in the system throughout the year. And some of us would sort of support a QE, QT type of programme uh, which was achieving the inflation target. Uh, I'm not quite so happy about the QT side of things, but I'm quite happy for what we would call QE uh, to achieve an inflation target. And we would always want to remind anyone who's critical of what's going on to not forget the time lags involved. Because if I do things to money today, if I increase the amount of cash in the economy, uh, then the impact of that won't hit the economy for anything up to another 18 months, 12 to 18 months. There's no immediate effect. And this has disadvantages in some way, because if you're a Keynesian economist, then you would be quite happy to put money into the economy and they say to everyone, look, there's no inflation. No problem about putting money in the economy. MMT, exactly the same. No inflation, we put money into the economy because that won't come for another year or so. So for another year, you might keep putting money in the economy, keep putting money in the economy, and then inflation starts to hit. And you go, ah, what's wrong now? And when you go, ah, what's wrong now? It's too late. You've created that inflation and you can start taking money out. You can push interest rates up. You can do whatever you like. But that inflation has got to come through the system as a result of what you did a year or more ago. So that is what monetarists would say. And monetarists would also add to this because quite often when uh, you've caused inflation and there's a time lag and it happens, the Keynesians have got an excuse. They say, no, no, this is not inflation which is caused by monetary expansion a year ago. Don't be silly. This is just cost push inflation. This is the result of costs now. It may be the exchange rate that's fallen or oil prices that have risen or energy prices uh, or wages that uh, are coming back. These are the things which have caused this inflation here. It sort of delays uh, the uh, day of reckoning as far as uh, uh, Keynesian economists are concerned. But cost push inflation is just a logical fallacy. It cannot exist. Because by definition, inflation is more units of money used in the same number of transactions. And putting oil prices up, the falling exchange rate, putting wages up, none of those increase the units of money in the economy. They all happen with the same amount of money in the economy. The only one who can increase the number of units in the economy and the monetary demand in the economy is the Bank of England. So whenever you get inflation, whenever, any time, it's all to do with the way the Bank of England has managed monetary demand. It's nothing to do with cost push factors, which are just something that uh, um, is fairly easy for people to go, oh yes, if oil prices have gone up, that's going to push energy prices up, that's going to push oil prices up, that must have been the cause of inflation. But it's not. There are obviously articles on my blog that explain this for those of you who still uh, uh, want to go into this in a little bit more detail. So no changes in costs actually change the level of monetary demand in the economy and don't have any effect on the average level of prices. They can all change relative prices. Some go up, some go down, but the average won't change under those circumstances. And the central bank has this responsibility for inflation. Uh, because it can control the one thing that causes inflation, which is monetary demand. You know, why do you think the Bank of England agrees to a target of 2%? It couldn't agree to a target of 2% if it was falling exchange rates that caused inflation, or if uh, wage rises caused inflation, or if oil prices or commodity prices caused inflation. The Bank of England couldn't agree to a target, could it? But it agrees to a target because it controls inflation 100%. Now, if you look at, say, what, what has happened in the economy uh, since the global financial crisis and has the Bank of England uh, uh, managed things well or not, um, I will argue it QE'd too much 
too soon when it pumped the 435 billion pounds into the economy. Uh, it's fairly obvious it was too quickly. And indeed, talking to the Bank of England at the time, they had no idea how much money they needed to put into the economy, uh, but they knew it was a certain amount uh, that they had better go over. And if anything, you want to overdo it, not underdo it. And they did exactly that. They overdid it. They put too much money into the economy. So this was 2009. By 2011, inflation had risen. It was 5.2%. CPI, 6.4% RPI in 2011, caused by uh, the rapid increase in quantitative easing. Again, you'll have to go to another article on my blog, but RPI is the truer and better measure of inflation, not CPI. CPI undervalues inflation, and it's not for the reason that almost anyone thinks. It's because of the way the average is calculated. CPI is calculated uh, geometrically and RPI arithmetically, and arithmetically is closer to understanding changes in the value of money, whereas uh, a geometric average actually undervalues the change uh, and undervalues the change in the value of money. So they pumped too much money into the economy. They caused inflation to go up to nearly 6.5%. It caused a large current account deficit on the balance of payments because when you pump money into the economy, people buy more imports. And sometimes exports are redirected into the home market because it's now becoming a little more profitable. And that can produce a large current account deficit on the balance of payments. And that large current account deficit on the balance of payments um, is exactly what happened. Uh, so we had a, a fairly weak currency. It went down at one time by over 40% against most major currencies between 2007 and 2012, showing that we were the, probably the ones who were uh, expanding uh, monetary demand faster than anyone else. So what was happening was uh, too much money was being put into the economy. The impact of doing that is on uh, inflation. Now, if we come to the current situation, uh, you've got uh, the pandemic as it stands at the moment. And the pandemic has increased M, this one here considerably. So the furlough scheme, uh, the quantitative easing going up to £895 billion, government spending, taxation is falling, not rising because of the unemployment uh, situation and the contraction that's taking place in output. So the initial response to the pandemic was to pump M. But at the same time, you have lockdowns. So you've all got to stay at home. So V has actually slowed during lockdowns and will continue to slow all the time that lockdowns continue. People will have money and they won't be able to go out and spend it. So V slows. Now, with M going up and V slowing, the impact on the other side, P and T, is indeterminate. We could get uh, deflation. We could actually get a fall in the average level of prices for a period of time based upon the contraction in, uh, sorry, the slowing in V. However, we hope at some point in the not too distant future, we will return to normality. And as soon as we do return to normality, then V will increase back to the pre-crisis level, which means we've got M increase considerably, V back to normal. That will affect prices and transactions. And it will uh, have, I can think, a considerable impact on inflation uh, towards the end of 2021 going into uh, 2022 when I'm sure you will see inflation well above target, perhaps even double digit inflation by then and perhaps a Bank of England pointing your attention towards cost push inflation as being the main cause of it when of course the cause of it is what is going on now, not what happens uh, then. So a return to normality, I think you will find uh, a, an increase in inflation, even up to uh, sort of double digit levels. Uh, but we wait and see. Um, inflation has been very low, which has you know, encouraged people to think, well, there's no need to worry too much. Is there? If you looked uh, 
uh, in uh, October 2015, CPI actually dipped uh, momentarily uh, by 0.1%. So you had one month of deflation. RPI was still 0.8%, the real measure. So you didn't actually have any deflation. Uh, in 2016, it had started to rise. So CPI was 0.6% and RPI was uh, up at 1.8%. And then we go above 2% by 2017. Uh, we have CPI at 2.9% and RPI at 3.9%. And then we come back to the current situation where I'm telling you that M is going up but V is going down. And you've got a slowing now of CPI. It's down at 0.3% and RPI at 0.9%. But once you return to a normal situation, then as I've suggested to you, the prediction is uh, that uh, you could have much higher inflation as we go through towards the end of next year and into 2022. So that's the sort of inflation profile I would suggest will happen. And if that does happen, and of course it does mean that the Bank of England has failed in its policy to keep inflation on target at 2%. But we have to wait and see on that. I can't accuse them of that until it happens. Can I? Now, Keynesians. If you're uh, Keynesians, you look at things very differently. And in fact, that's why the government are acting the way that they are acting now, because there's a big output gap appearing in the economy as people become unemployed during the pandemic response. Um, and they want to close the output gap, encourage economic growth. Their argument is demand is weak. There's no inflation um, and therefore it's time to pursue an aggressive expansionary policy. Uh, and that means more government spending. Don't worry about taxation falling and don't worry about financing that uh, government spending by printing money uh, because uh, there's no sign of any inflation in the economy. Unless, of course, the monetarists are right and you see the inflation starting to come through this time um, next year. The quantitative easing programme, the Keynesians are happy with that, uh, and uh, uh, most central banks around the world seem to be uh, quite uh, happy there. The external account figures will deteriorate at the moment. They haven't deteriorated because of the contraction that's taking place in purchases as people are locked down uh, and stay at home. Uh, but for the Keynesian economists, it's necessary for them to focus on intervention, demand management policies to boost growth, boost employment and take us out of this pandemic. That's the dangerous uh, approach to what uh, I would consider to be next year's stagflation, that is a stagnant economy with relatively high unemployment and accelerating inflation. Now, the Bank of England has found itself in rather a difficult situation. And the difficult situation is that it has talked a lot in the past, although not recently, about interest rates must normalise, they must go back to a, a higher level. But they can't change interest rates without giving the wrong signal because as soon as they put interest rates uh, up, that's a signal that the economy is booming and things are going well, which is hardly how you would describe things uh, at the moment. It's also impossible. It's something I've pointed out to, to all the central banks at one particular conference uh, that I was at, that none of them around the world can act independently of each other without creating a lot of volatility on the exchange rate. So one country raising its official rate, whether it's Fed funds rate uh, or whether it's the refi rate or the UK bank rate, any one country doing it on its own will create a considerable impact on its exchange rate. In fact, it will, the exchange rate will rise. So it will become volatile. And the only way to avoid that is for all central banks to get together and agree to do the same thing at the same time. Now, the chances of you getting that happening, of getting bank, central bankers to get together and all agree to put interest rates up, it, it will never happen. Someone will always have an argument to say they can't put interest rates up. So um, the fact the Bank of England cannot do it on its own unilaterally means that uh, we're probably stuck with very low interest rates uh, and the damage 
that they do to the economy in terms of creating these distortions, creating these asset bubbles. Uh, and you can see them now. You can see house price asset bubbles. You can see stock market asset bubbles. And the word bubble is used advisedly because uh, we do know that bubbles burst. And uh, at some point in time, uh, we need to wait for that burst to take place. Quantitative easing was essential at one point in time, which I'll explain uh, in just a moment. Uh, but uh, the Bank of England should be very careful about what it is currently doing, because that is creating what I think will be a lot of damage in the not too distant future. Um, there is an argument to say that uh, the programme as it stands at the moment is countering fiscal austerity. Um, there's another argument uh, which is exactly the opposite of that. Again, go to my blog to read this. There's been no fiscal austerity. Fiscal austerity suggests governments have been cutting their expenditure, which they haven't. But they have been having to redirect their expenditure because larger and larger borrowing requirements increase national debt, increase the amount of money required to service that debt. So governments have had to service a bigger national debt, which means even though they're spending more money, they've tried to make cuts in other areas. Now, the other areas are real areas. You know, we're making cuts in education or making cuts in health. Everyone notices that, and education and health think this is austerity. But austerity is a general word to cover the whole economy. What we've had is some difficult decisions and some bad decisions made, uh, but it's not, there's no fiscal austerity. There's fiscal profligacy all the time when governments are involved. The austerity, unfortunately, is felt by certain sectors in the economy, but it's not an overall contraction in the economy. In fact, the economy has been expanding too rapidly, and it's a rough rule of thumb. All the time you've got any inflation whatsoever, even if it's only, as at the moment, 0.3%, it means that you have got excessive monetary demand filtering through in your economy, and, and that's as what has been happening throughout this whole period of time. So, from a monetary point of view, it's no good if you're a monetarist in uh, being uh, anything other than steady and stable growth in monetary demand. Because the one thing you can do as a central bank is maintain inflation at whatever rate you like. Ideally, I'd like 0% inflation, but 2% is the better number because if you try and achieve naught, you'll go down into negative territory and negative territory very quickly changes people's perceptions about what they're doing with money. And if you think that prices are falling, you actually do slow the speed that you pass money on because it's increasing in value. Uh, you put back purchases uh, and that's not good for the economy. It just accelerates the problem that you've got, uh, which, uh, uh, which occurs with inflation. Now that's what the, Bank of England can't, can do. What it can't do is all the things that Keynesians and modern monetary theorists promise. It can't create jobs. It can't boost economic growth. It can't do any of those things, but it can manage uh, the inflation. And it needs to be aware of the fact that uh, higher inflation actually destroys jobs. It doesn't create them. It actually does destroy jobs by distorting markets and distorting market signals. So what we want is uh, OMOs, open market operations, maintaining liquidity, quantitative easing, uh, or whatever we're going to call it, uh, maintaining this steady growth in aggregate monetary demand. And I would not use interest rates to influence any of this. I'd have a sort of rule uh, that if I had, well, if I had to have a rule, uh, then I would just say interest rates or bank rate, particularly has got to be at least 2% above whatever the current rate of inflation is but I don't want interference uh, in interest rates and uh, that's a little bit of a pipe dream as far as uh, uh, we're concerned. So let me conclude because this was all about is the Bank of England a villain or is it uh, our saviour? And I'm trying to put a bit of balance here because I think people all don't criticise the Bank of England and they should. Um, so there's a whole series of uh, issues that uh, I will expand a little bit later on in another lecture but uh, 
the Bank of England trying to ret return to the pre-war gold exchange rate, I've already explained, was a big mistake made by the Bank of England. Allowing inflation to rise to 30% uh, during the 1970s, supporting Keynesian fiscal expansion, was a bad mistake uh, on their part. Um, they made a rather slow and inappropriate response to Northern Rock, the liquidity problem that they had, and the fact that they announced it to, to everybody uh, had that systemic problem of uh, people worrying about what's going to happen next in other banks. They have, of course, misled people over the causes of inflation, uh, although they give themselves the get-out clause of, no, we don't actually say that uh, there are cost-push causes of uh, inflation. We just imply it by, what, by the way we say it. They've misused interest rate policy. Uh, they've fueled asset bubbles and they've destabilised financial markets by what they've done. And at the moment, they're allowing government to finance a lot of wasteful spending uh, through QE during this current pandemic. So um, lots of things where I consider the Bank of England to be a villain. What have they done well? They, they have done things well. Uh, arguably, they managed monetary policy very well after the Bretton Woods uh, Conference uh, post-World War II, right through to June 1972. You could argue that they couldn't mismanage it then because they had to maintain a fixed exchange rate, but uh, let's give them a bit of credit. It was managed reasonably well during that period of time. They actually managed inflation very well after the Bank of England was given its official independence in 1997 up to 2006. That's when things worked quite well. And then uh, it did avoid deflation after the global financial crisis. So we did have, uh, um, or we didn't have the deflation that was expected as the result of what they did, mainly to QE, not to interest rates. So they have done good things and uh, uh, I don't criticise them on the regulatory side. I think that uh, the regulatory side they've done quite well. Uh, it's the monetary policy side where I really would criticise what they have done. So if ever you come across someone at the Bank of England, uh, then do ask them questions. Um, ask them how well they think the current system is performing. Could it be better? Uh, ask them about the too big to fail uh, thing with large banks, how they're dealing with that because uh, the taxpayer doesn't want to be bailing out uh, large banks into the future. Um, ask them if they feel there's too much regulation or too little regulation, or are they actually regulating the right things? Should they as a central bank just concentrate on in liquidity and inflation target? Should they not concentrate on, say, capital adequacy rules and regulations, which I described previously in a lecture as something that uh, an international organisation uh, like the Bank of International Settlements and the, the Baal committees can probably deal with better uh, than a central bank. Um, ask them about regulatory moral hazard because they have created certain situations, particularly with the financial services compensation scheme for people with deposits at retail banks. They're protected up to £85,000, but has that meant that the commercial sector has become a bit more risk-taking, knowing that uh, its deposits are protected by uh, a government scheme backed by the taxpayer. Um, so always be critical of your central bank. It's, it's working for you, but uh, is it working in the best possible way? And uh, what damage could be avoided? if they did things differently. So I hope you've uh, enjoyed our little sortie into uh, the Bank of England. The next lecture, I will look specifically at central banks, including central banks around the world, not just uh, within the UK, because we are in a, an international situation uh, where what one central bank does is determined by what other central banks are doing. Uh, and I don't really want to blame just the central bank in this country for the mistakes that there have been. Uh, there are other mistakes being made in, in a worldwide context, which we'll deal with uh, in Lecture 9 next time. Thank you very much.